On the back of a Fed that it could be, well, it's a matter of time that they're going to be announcing this taper, you're still a Southeast Asia that's still reeling from the pandemic. And as much as they want to ease and, and provide more stimulus, it's getting a little bit harder. What's the backdrop like now, do you think? Exactly. Policymakers are in a bit of a bind because Southeast Asia was hit really hard by the Delta mutation. And at the same time, there's a desire to do a bit more. They're doing as much as they can with fiscal, but it's really hard to provide additional monetary policy easing in this circumstance, actually. So the best case scenario, keep things steady, hope that taper won't be too disruptive, and most likely we don't think it will. External balance is pretty strong, so they can probably ride out mm. the taper, any taper turbulence, but ultimately not really ease further. Mm. Uh, out of all the central banks, which one is the most live, which one is the most, has the most pressing need to do something, either put the, foot, uh, the pedal to the metal or otherwise? So it would probably be the Philippines. And actually, if you look currently at COVID cases in the region, the Philippines is the epicenter, actually. Um, so the BSP did signal that it would like to do a little bit more. It could always, you know, lower the policy rate again. But it's also the only country that's really facing some inflation concerns right now in the region, mostly driven by food, food inflation, so they can look through it. But it really puts, uh, you know, kind of constrains the policymakers' options. Uh, Joseph, David here. Nice to see you, man. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, when you put everything together, this, I'll bring up the S word. Stephanie, not stagflation. Uh, where, where would that be a key risk among the economies that you cover? So really, in Southeast Asia and Asia in general, there's not much of an inflation concern. Okay. That's mostly because, you know, there's been a very prolonged hit from Delta. Um, so we're not really seeing any signs of, of uh, demand inflation. So it's really just in the Philippines and Southeast Asia and India that are dealing with some supply inflation. And particularly in the case of the Philippines, we think that the BSP can look through this, right? It's clearly driven by supply bottlenecks with food prices. You have typhoon season coming. Uh, it's currently within <laughs> the typhoon season. So we're not really worried about stagflation. It's really just really poor growth fundamentals, uh, kind of the prolonged hit from COVID, the fact that vaccination rates are pretty low in the region. And that really makes it difficult for many countries to live with COVID as long as you have vaccination rates at these low levels. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, BI. Um, that's the one that's pretty front and center. It's, it's quite interesting. People were quite surprised about how they were expanding that burden sharing program. Um, how are they going to appease the credit agencies now, do you think? Exactly. That's really the crucial <laughs> concern here. And it's very interesting what BI did because they've basically pre-committed to financing the government through 2022. Right. And next year is going to be a time when many central banks in the region are hiking interest rates. And here you have this pre-commitment to continue financing. So ultimately, the risks are pretty contained, actually. Because mm. actually, if you look at Indonesia, their FDI inflows right now more than cover the current account deficit, which is pretty rare for Indonesia. So their external fundamentals are very solid right now. And that provides BI with a bit of flexibility to do this policy for the time being. But like you said, really, the focus is going to be on next year. How do they kind of start that exit policy we trust that the central bank will start to actually kind of drain the liquidity when they need to. But it's really going to be the focus on the credit, right, on the government's policies. They're going to need to pass new tax reform, and that has to come into that. That's what I was going to get to. I mean, how much is monetary policy here really more of a sop to international investors and the like as opposed to its efficacy compared to fiscal policy, which you're alluding to here, which is surely much more important. And yeah. that's going to be the crucial part of it, as you say. And also liquidity feeds into all that. Yes. Exactly. And I give BI a lot of credit because they realize that without effective fiscal policy, you can't really address the crisis. So they use their monetary policy to help fiscal policy. They address the crisis. Um, and now, you know, the focus is how can they normalize deficits, right? And there's a whole debate. Do central banks, do, do policymakers need to... And how does the informal economy fit into all this as well? That's exactly. the other bit. Exactly. Yeah. And we'd like to say, look, you know, they should keep deficits high. There's ultimately a developmental reason to do so. But a country like Indonesia needs to fund its deficits over the long term to fulfill its development goals, right? And to that extent, you need to see some progress towards fiscal consolidation. It might not mean kind of coming to a 3% deficit right away, but at least passing this tax reform, which is currently uh, presented to Parliament. So if they can at least show that they're serious about structural reforms, and they already have done that with the investment, with the labor laws, I think that would go a long way in kind of, uh, let's say, helping to dissipate any risks from this program. Uh, Joseph, on that same point, but to Thailand, and I'm just going to look at the, the forecasts for this year, consensus, full year, 1.2%, lowest in Southeast Asia, 4.1%, that's next year, full year again, lowest in Southeast Asia. There was chatter around increasing the debt limit, if you will, debt to GDP. Um, what are your thoughts around that, and how much can it actually help? Exactly. And similar to what, just, what Rashad was just saying, actually, you can ultimately, you know, cut the interest rate once again. It would help at the margins, but it really won't change much. There's very low demand for, you know, new loans right now. 
it would ease the debt burdening cost a little bit. But ultimately, what we think Thailand needs is really a structural change in policy. Uh, using fiscal policy over the long term. Because if you think about the Thai economy, the main engine has been taken out, right? One of the main engines, tourism. And even on the manufacturing FDI side, they haven't been really gaining much commitment. So we think what they need to do is show a long-term fiscal plan, really finally deliver these infrastructure plans, and that could at least provide some you know, structural boosts to long-term prospects of the economy. And the move from the government of kind of signaling a higher debt limit is actually good news to us.